Well, thank you so much, Simon. And um, we have a lot of questions coming through on Twitter and a couple from the audience. So we have 10 minutes right now, and we're going to pound away at those questions. And anything that we don't get to or we want to discuss further, we can take into the panel discussion at the end of the day. So take it away, Mia. OK, so the first question that's come through is regarding um, the variation that we see in wolf dominance hierarchies and how that can lead to polarized views, and wondering whether um, there's understanding we can gain from other animal species to help us in this area, um, particularly in relation to culture. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, about 20 or 30 years ago, the Japanese actually were the first one to get interested in the concept of culture in animals. And by the way, a lot of people say you should say culture. Uh, acculturation, uh, something like this. It's obviously not the same as humans. And it started with primates, actually. So there's a fantastic literature on culture in primates that I actually, uh, you know, you probably have heard of Emo, the potato, potato washing monkey, uh, Japanese macaque. So there was a lot of back and forth between anthropologists and biologists about this, if it was really culture and et cetera. But regardless, it's this idea that sometimes evolution can work uh, through behavior. And that's really what culture means in a way. And this is getting very, very trendy in biology right now, this idea that actually sometimes very rapid changes can occur within social groups that will be transmitted from generation to generation, but it's not genetic per se. Although Hal Whitehead has a model showing that it may actually become uh, genetic through linkage and et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting proposition. So yeah, studying other species will certainly help. And actually, I think this emerging field of studying primates uh, and cetaceans and, and hopefully soon canids uh, will shed a lot, a lot of light on this. Yeah. But it's all about the, how diverse they are and uh, much more complex, I think, than we initially thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't fit one mold, essentially. So there is evidence of, I guess, this cultural effect. Oh, I haven't got hands to do the inverted commas, yeah. Um, not just in primates, but you said cetaceans, so whales as well. Um, and potentially these differences that we see in the dominance hierarchies across different wolf groups could be um, something that we need to study further to see whether it's a similar effect or you... Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, th I think a lot of the assumptions about this a long time ago were about, you know, some groups would say, well, there's strong dominance hierarchies in walls, and people would say, well, I don't see it, so you must be wrong. Well, why? So maybe you see a strong dominance hierarchies in your walls, and you don't, and that just means you're both right. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and, and I think it, it will... Uh, so we have to change our way of thinking about this, and I, I start seeing this with Europeans. I, I, I have quite a bit of an exchange with Europeans actually on this, is this idea that we, we need to talk to each other because we are not finding the same things. We're not seeing the same things, and that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, another question that came in from Rachel from uh, the UK. She asked, neurologically, predation is not aggression. Could you expand on this? That was something that you raised. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's, uh, well, it, it's, yeah, because it's not the same parts of the brain that are activated, essentially. And there's some very good, unfortunately, mostly invasive models of this with cats, with rats, etc., that show actually that during predatory behavior, including foraging behavior, actually, foraging and predatory behavior are very much the same in terms of which part of the brain are getting activated. But it's not the same than when you're actually really into an aggression, especially a reactive aggression, where you're, you know, maybe fear is part of it. Mm -hmm. So again, like I said earlier, Panksepp was mentioned by Ray, I believe, um, maybe even uh, Patricia, uh, but, and a lot of you know him, and I'll get into some of his stuff uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, but it's this idea that there's many different systems in the brain that all interact with each other. And yeah, predation, there's more and more evidence that it's not the same thing as, uh, as aggression. And there's a great example of this that I show my students sometimes. You can find, I believe, on the National Geographic website, is this amazing sequence of a mother cheetah that just caught a, a baby gazelle, injured it just a little bit, and very tenderly brings it, you know, very softly towards our cubs so they can actually practice uh, hunting on it. And there's something very disheartening about it because she's very, very gentle and very tender, and yet this is a lunch that she's preparing for the kids kind of thing, a practice uh, dummy. It's, it's awful, but... Um, it, in, in a sense, you can see that these, it doesn't mean that uh, because you're after your lunch that you need to be angry. When I cook, I'm usually not angry. <laughs> I do drink a lot of wine while I do it, though. 
Um, we've got one that came through from the theatre audience, and that's asking, is there a distinction between dominance and aggression? And if so, could you please discuss whether they are mutually exclusive or related? Well, they're related, but they're not, they're not talking about the same thing. And dominance is not just aggression. Dominance is submission, dominance is all the other behaviors as well. Uh, you know, when people come up with dominance hierarchies, if they come up with those hierarchies and this, these social matrices just based on aggression, like I said, that's wrong. Um, because for me, that concept actually is not very useful. I'm more interested actually in a social hierarchy, which again, you will extract from information from play. Um, that graduate student I mentioned, Barbara Molnar, actually looked at uh, what we call in social psychology proxemics, which is just this idea of um, wolves spending time next to each other. And we count it in the field, it's actually, I believe, in Langolani that started doing this, um, uh, but wolf linked. So because we're often like 80, 100 meters away, whatever that's in feet, 300 feet? Okay, anyway. Uh, and we count the number of wolves between them. And it's never random. Uh, if, you, if you lie down next to somebody, it's usually because you like that individual. Uh, and all this will get you to understand the, the structure, the dynamic of the group. And it's not just dominance, and it's not just a dominance hierarchy. But aggression is part of it, you know, but it's only one tiny part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that people have overemphasized the aggression part in all of this and forgot about all of the other behaviors, including the positive affiliative ones. I'm sure we'll come back to that later, also during the panel. Um, something that came in from Super Cacheros in Mexico. They said, uh, what are your thoughts on social hierarchies in dogs that live in big crowded shelters? Oh. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't study dogs in those, in those contexts. Uh, that's, that, yeah, that's not my area. I'm not comfortable answering that. I, I, mean, I mean, okay, let me pick up on one thing. Crowded, right there, means stress. And yes, stress can yield uh, you know, to, a, to aggression, obviously. Mm -hmm. So um, you should not have crowded conditions, basically, with wolves, dogs, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or humans, for that matter. Would it, would it matter if it was big crowded shelters that have a, you know, a constantly revolving uh, set of dogs or a stable group of dogs? Something, I'm just thinking about well, how you would think yeah, about the question. No. Well, actually, if you look at the work that Bedosa has done in France, um, they have these amazing uh, enclosures where they, they throw dogs with each other and they have this autoregulation idea that they'll figure it out. Uh, sometimes there's some rough edges on this, but yeah, usually they do kind of figure it out actually after a while. Um, but if you keep changing and rotate, you're making it so much harder for them to figure it out. It takes a while sometimes for them to figure it out. Mm -hmm. They create their little network and then it's fine. And you throw something else in there like, oh God, we're gonna start from scratch again. So I would say no, stable groups are much better, but certainly not crowded, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had a few questions coming through um, sort of talking about motor patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly after some people had seen the example of the fox caching yeah. their chicks, um, wanting to ask, I guess to try and give it the context and further understand it, are there examples of motor patterns from humans that you can describe to help, I guess, as a parallel to what we're talking about in canids? Oh, well, you see, this is interesting because humans don't produce that many um, uh, well, actually, Abel Ebesfeld, um, a human ethologist, has, has worked on this quite a bit, and he talks a lot about these universals that, in a way, actually, Patricia talked about, you know, some of these things that we, all cultures tend to do. And again, it's a set of rules, very implicit rules, but, you know, like the flirting thing, how do you show that you're interested? Um, and, and people are not aware, even, that they're doing these things. So these are actually great examples, and I would not call them fixed action patterns here. I, would, I think they're actually action sequences with a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, you can be very subtle, or you can be very not subtle, you know. <laughs> so, and, and, and that, that's all about the degrees of freedom, essentially, right? You touch your hair. In men, it's different, I know. But. <laughs> what do we do? I don't know. I know we're not subtle, I know that. <laughs> okay. um, kind of a light one, but when people find out what you do, what's the question that you're asked most often? You know, do they just go into a dog story or is there a particular question? Because <laughs> we're pretty sure, I mean, based from our experiences anyway, when you're at the dinner table and you say, I, I mean, I, 
I don't get to say I study wolves, yeah. but I'm pretty sure you just win yeah. immediately yeah. in terms of <laughs> occupations. And everyone, for us, they want to share their dog stories. For you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to mention what I do usually <laughs> if I can avoid it because it uh, it's just uh, makes me very uncomfortable in, in many, many situations. And I w- was exposed uh, way too many times in my career with people I think that study wolves for the wrong reasons and it's mostly to get some attention. Mm-hmm. I will always remember a student that was in the lab where I did my PhD that told us once, um, you know, I study wolves because it helps my dating life. Because she could go at bars and say what people would ask, so what do you do? And she would say, I study wolves. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe right there's the perfect time to (laughs) to break. Thank you so much. We're going to take a lunch break here in Newport and um, we'll be back with the broadcast later on. Just check the schedule on the website at caninescience.info or keep in touch with us on Twitter and um, we'll let you know when we're back online. Thank 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 you. Thank you.